The F1 2024 season has proven to be an extremely unpredictable season with so many different winners and a lot of extreme events happening to make this season hopefully go down in history if we end up with a championship battle towards the end. It's crazy to even say that considering how the season started with Max Verstappen winning over 20 seconds and they're not even being a competition for P2. The fifth race in the season has completely changed 2024 and we've learned a lot when it comes to the back markers, the midfield, and really what is the top four teams in our sport and how it will impact the end of the season. We've gone through 18 races, we have six left, but let's talk about what we've learned in the 2024 F1 season and how this impacts the last six races. The obvious first topic and the one that's trending right now is Daniel Ricciardo and whether he'll be driving these last six races or Liam Lawson will be taking that position and this could be the end of his career. Daniel did start the season definitely on the back foot. He was far behind Yuki, who had an amazing start to the season, always getting up into the points paying positions in an RB that wasn't that great, but was being outperformed by Yuki. But ever since he got a chassis change in China, which supposedly changed nothing on the actual chassis, but maybe it was a good mental reset for Daniel, he then started to perform really well, but not good enough to actually keep the seat. Miami was one of those great performances, but ever since Miami, there haven't been those standout performances and Yuki's gotten a couple. In qualifying, it did end up being 12 to 6 within these 18 races we've had, so Daniel's always been on the back foot, but in the race, it's a different story. It's been much closer than in qualifying. Yuki does have more points just because he's been up in the points more often than Daniel. And last year, Liam Lawson really did prove himself and maybe there really is a contractual agreement as to why Daniel has to step out and Liam gets to step in. With the rise of rookies like Franco Colapinto, it's definitely a question now on whether older drivers should be driving. That's why Bottas to see it's getting questioned so much regardless of the season he's having. And it seems like F1 teams are moving in different directions. The older drivers of the past are not gonna really have another chance in our sports. The back markers in Formula One, kind of like there's a top four, there's also a bottom two as of right now, which is Sauber and surprisingly Alpine. The Sauber team turning into Audi has had an atrocious 2024 season. They've never even been close to a points paying position with the exception of Bahrain where Guan Yu Zhou actually was in P11. He had an opportunity to fight with Stroll, but realistically, he wasn't that close to the Aston Martin. The upgrades they brought to the car really haven't actually brought any performance to it. And overall, this season has just been a scrap. And the majority of this team is owned by Audi, but I think they're quite embarrassed to actually put their logo onto the car because the car is not competitive in the slightest. But when you look at a team like Alpine who owns their own engine, makes their own chassis and so on, and to see them in consistent P9 in the constructors, there isn't much of a difference between Sauber and Alpine. Sauber yet again is still a team that's taking engines from another engine supplier. And they're kind of in that middle in between phase before transferring to becoming a big team while Alpine has been a big team for a very long period of time and they have never gotten the results that a team of that size should be getting. With Ocon leaving and putting Jack Dewan in the car, Pierre Gasly now has a big job ahead of him. He is now the main guy they're going to go for on the development of the car. Putting it around him, he's always been a very good qualifier and actually pretty good in the race. He's had a very underrated 2021 season, if you ask me, but the team is going to put a lot of focus on him and they've kind of been reworking the internal part of the team. All the personnel at the team has been changed so many times within the last five years. They've pretty much gone through six different team principles and there's still a possibility they don't even have a Renault engine in 2026 with the talks being surrounded with Mercedes giving them an engine in 26. Most of the midfield teams are actually inching up and coming closer to the top four. Williams had a big upgrade in Zandvoort and it's obviously paid dividends with them being close to the points every single race. Aston has been a bit more consistent with Alonso scoring in four out of the last five races and they have a huge upgrade coming for Coda. Haas has been impressive after taking away Gunther Steiner. RB themselves have been very up and down, but their ups are very high while their downs are also very low. The big talk for these four teams is upgrades and whether they work or not. It's a very up and down game between these four and they don't have the consistency like a McLaren and not even the consistency like a Ferrari who hasn't been the best, 
but they have got some stuff to work in and it's given them big track performance. They need that. Coda is going to be a season defining race for these four teams on whether they can actually challenge it in 2025. The more teams in the top, the merrier. The Red Bull team has had a very fluctuating season. At some points, the car looked like it was by far the best, and in others, they were almost fighting with the midfield at some point. Monza was just one of those tracks that really did not stand out for them, which was quite a surprise considering 22 and 23 were standout performances by the team, and nobody was even close to competitive with the car. Singapore definitely seemed like a bit of a revival coming from Max Verstappen's way, and if Checo was able to qualify better, considering the tires didn't get up to temperature, it was the same problem revolving around the whole field, so it's not a very good excuse. But if he was in Q3, let's say he got around P5 or P6, he definitely could have been competitive with the rest of the top four. They're putting a lot of their money on Coda because while Singapore was a good race, they were still about 30 seconds behind Lando, that's with a bit of front wing damage, and Lando wasn't really spreading his wings at the very end. The other two top teams within this top four in F1, Mercedes and Ferrari have had a very up and down season, kind of like Red Bull, but in different ways. The inconsistency between these two teams has really hurt them. Ferrari honestly could have been up in that McLaren position if the upgrades in Imola went right, and they didn't have to backtrack from Spain onwards. Mercedes had a great three or four races in a row, and now the inconsistency is coming to bite them again, with them doing kind of decently in qualifying, but the race ends up always being a toss-up on whether they could be potentially fighting for the win, or they're fighting with the Aston Martins in P8, P9, and so on. Mercedes has been very lenient on upgrades, they've been very careful on what they want to introduce to the car. While Ferrari has been pretty adamant on adding upgrades to the car, they just added that flexi front wing to Singapore, which has given them performance, and the modifications they added to Monza on the floor have actually given them a big boost of performance, and the car is much more consistent, and they have a base to go off of, even for 2025. Whether they decide to change that front suspension will matter on what happens in the last six races of the season. Mercedes, on the other hand, also has a decision to make on whether they're going to go with the same suspension that McLaren and Red Bull run to see if they can actually lower that car properly without getting the downsides of the balance going away when they introduce a new floor and the upgrades not actually doing what they should be. But obviously the most important and the most fun part of 2024 has been whether we get this championship battle or not, with Lando being much closer after a victory in Singapore. And while the gap is still pretty significant, and it's actually never been done in F1 history to reduce this gap and win the championship, Lando quite convincingly does have the fastest car, and that's why the next race will determine whether the championship battle can actually happen, and can Oscar Piastri step up to get these P2 positions to help Lando score some more points on Max Verstappen. If Max was to hold P2 in every single race up until now, including the sprints, he would end up actually keeping the championship, not by much, but it would be a victory. Lando has had his inconsistent moments, Baku was pretty unlucky if you actually look at what happened with the yellow flags. Some people could argue that he should have just ran through them, called it a day, got the 5 place grid penalty, but it's very hard to determine what you need to do in those moments, and sadly, he was just caught out at the wrong time. McLaren is also adamant on bringing huge upgrades to Coda, and it's going to be a tech race at the end of the day. Red Bull isn't far off, they're about two or three tenths off in pace if we look at Singapore, but Coda will show us who's got the best balanced car, which is pretty obvious right now, it's McLaren, and if Lando can get a victory there and actually do pretty well in the sprint with another victory, he could gain a total of an 8 point gap if he finishes P1, P1 and Max finishes P2, P2, but with Oscar hopefully getting up there, the gap could become bigger and that's what he's going to need to reduce what's more than a 50 point gap as of right now. It's been fun and I hope that this continues in the last six races. You guys tell me what's been your favorite moment of 2024 so far and do you expect these last six races to be very heated between our championship rivals? Please leave your thoughts down in the comments below, leave a like and subscribe, it would mean the world, and peace.